So I had to record and explain a lot of stuff about time and space and, you know, went past where I left off before, but I kind of just wanted to start over because I didn't like the way it turned out. I ended up spending too much time talking about this stuff, and I don't think I need to spend that much time talking about it, uh, what should be a relatively simple concept. So I'm going to start over from the beginning. Let's get going. All right, so um, we kind of left off with the, you know, analogy of a frame of balls and all that. The really the important thing I wanted to get out of it was continuous continuous versus stages, right, of existence. So when you when you film something, you can only film the ball in certain stages of existence, like this. So this each one of these represents a different picture, and this represents the actual line it exists on. So you're filming a ball, and let's say someone kicks it. This is the line in which the ball follows and you record your camera here. This is the screen which you're recording it in, like that. And the first frame, the ball is here. That's your first picture. And the second picture, the ball is here. And the third picture, the ball is here. Now why is there that huge jump? Because the camera is only is taking a steady amount of frames per second. Let's say 24 frames per second. So it's very steady, but the ball is not moving at a very steady speed. The ball starts it starts to take off and get its momentum because it's being kicked and it gets really fast and then the ball starts to slow down as it reaches its highest arc and since the ball is slowing down at its highest arc you're capturing more balls you know closer together you know as far as you're overlapping these pictures right now so let's say I'm taking I'm taking these pictures on clear film and so I can overlap them and I can see each where each ball is like this okay so th this is where it can make sense the drawing makes sense so or I can I can you know flip the, I can flip them very quickly, making a movie. So in the first frame you see here, here, then you see here, 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 and then, it, then as it begins to fall, it begins to get faster, and so you get less amount of balls per frame. That is now when you're taking your pictures, the ball suddenly is there. It's like there because it's moving so fast. The, the difference would be if I had a window here where my camera is focused on, and I and I let's say I have a very high powered camera, and I shoot a I shoot an object going very quickly like this. I might only capture that object once and twice within the time that I, you know, I'm taking a bunch of, I'm taking a thousand frames a second. I'm taking all these pictures, but I only capture the bullet twice in its movement. If the bullet is moving much slower, or or whatever the object is moving much slower, I might capture it several times within that thousand frames a second. Now, now I have more pictures of the actual bullet moving, uh, and which would give them, which would be easier to watch in the eye. This might look like little blips on the screen, whereas this you might actually be able to see the movement or the illusion of movement. Okay, so that's all I really want to explain with the analogy. So suppose then, in the digital universe, that's pretty much how it is. Um, that is, in the digital universe, I'm trying to see if I can get on camera and draw for you guys. In a digital universe, um, time and space are a result of functions, of mathematical, mathematical functions underneath reality, underneath the Planck time, underneath the Planck distance. And so in Zeno's paradox, you couldn't, the, the, you know, Achilles can never take the turtle, and, and that seems seems to be true, because if he has to travel an infinite amount of distance, how can he do that in a, in, a, in a finite amount of time? It doesn't seem possible. And so there must be some, if you get small enough and small enough, as, as you continue dividing that in half and half and half and half and half and half and half. There has to get a point in the microscopic world where it can no longer be divided in half. And there is. And we can just call that Planck time, let's say. So eventually you reach this in both time and space, since time and space are related, thus it's called space time. You reach a point where you can't divide any smaller. And that's as small as it can get. Well, what lies beneath that? There is no space or time beneath that, right? Space and time cease to exist. And this is where the mathematical functions are, are happening. Or, in my belief, this is where the fundamental properties are taking place that make all reality work the way it works. They, they are the eternal fundamental properties. But we could call whatever that, however complex, let's say it is a very complex mathematical type algorithm system, then that would be the fundamental property. That whole entire, all of those different functions working together. Each function being its own property. I'll get into the philosophy in a second, uh, which is very cool about God and then, you know, and philosophically what seems more sound as far as what would be true. But anyway, so um, then if you look at space and time this way, then basically this so-called continuous line that you see, the, the fastest an object can be moving is the speed of light, and the fastest camera you can have is the speed of light, and so there is a, a stage where you can no longer divide in half. 
So if something's moving very quickly at close to speed of light, and your camera can only take pictures at speed of light, then you would have that same result where you'd have it existing in stages. So what I'm trying to say with this analogy is this is how reality actually works. So let's look at it as a grid, and this should hopefully kind of make sense what I'm trying to say. So you have a grid, and this is exist and this is representing space-time, where things can exist in space. I should have made the grid much simpler, but oh well. So let's say it's one, two, three, four, five. So like one, two, three, four, five up, and that will be considered the uh, z axis, and then the x axis will go this way. Let's say it's not probably not really. It doesn't really matter if it's the way it's supposed to be or not. Oops, one, two, three, four. Oops, that's supposed to be a four. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so if I say right now the object is existing here, then it exists at at x three and at y2. Okay, so that represents where it exists, and that could be represented as bi and binary code. And so that's where the object exists now. Now I say the object moves over here. Now along the time, the time it takes to move from there to there, let's say, is a second. So now it's from there to there, so a second later it's over here. Well, what about this in-between stage? There was no in-between stage, because this represents, let's say, half a second, you know, and halves don't exist. And this is true for the quantum world. You have whole steps. Things exist in whole steps. They exist, exist in, in an upspin or downspin. They don't exist in any other spin in between. And you would think they would. Like, how do they get from up to bottom? How does a, how does a quark get from an upspin to a bottom spin? How is that even possible? What about all these stages in between? It doesn't have to go through all those stages in between to get from one to the other? No, it doesn't. It literally just goes from up to down. Just like that. There's no in-between stages. Well, how is that possible? How can you get from one stage to the next without in-between stages? And the only way that seems possible, and this is why a lot of people are headed toward digital physics, is if reality was indeed digital, if it was information-based. If the, as John Wheeler said, a great physicist said, that all of reality, when you get down to its core, is digital or, or, or is information-based doesn't necessarily have to be digital, but information-based. So what's important to understand here, then, is everyone's trying to figure out what is the basis of reality. Some say the base of reality is God himself, that God's the base of reality. That's where you get to like Hinduism and stuff, monism. Some say the base of reality is strings, M-theory. Some say the base of reality is quantum fluctuations. But that doesn't really explain everything, because what is a quantum fluctuation exactly? And um, some say, you know, that, that, that's a standard model, by the way. You know, and some say different things. Well, the digital, digital physicists say it is, it is numbers, math. Basically that, uh, what was his name? It started with the P, the Greek guy. Plat Plagorian, Plat, Plat, I mean, Plat Plagoras, something like that. Plagoras, some, some, I don't know what his name was, I can't remember. But he said the basis of all reality is numbers. That's the fundamentals, the fundamentals of reality. Reality is made up of numbers. And they're kind of saying he's right. And so, if, if, if information was true, and if, if, if reality was information-based, then you would expect to see this in reality. That is, you'd expect to see uh, jumps, stages of jumps. You wouldn't expect to see continu continuums. Continuums, you know, infinites would be very hard to calculate. So if, if we were in a, in a type of digital world or in a type of virtual reality, what would you expect to see? As we begin looking, and, and where we expect to see this mostly is in the small world, and the smaller the better, the smaller we get, we'd expect to see more bizarreness because things wouldn't work the way we expect them to. They'd work like we'd think a digital world would work. That is, they would work in steps and stages. We would see jumps, boom, boom, like this. But the bigger the objects get, it'd be, it, the, the, the steps would be blurred. It'd be harder to see the steps. Just like um, on the screen, a curve can look like a true continuum or a true circle, but it's not. It's made of a bunch of individual pixels. In other words, the larger the object gets, or the further away you get from the object, the more it looks like that. But if you zoom in to your, to your monitor with the magnifying glass, you can start to see the individual pixels. And so the illusion goes away. So when everything's big, like us, our bodies and, and balls and, and stuff like that, these objects appear to, be conti to move continuously because they're so big. And so the illusion is there. But the smaller we get, the less the illusion will, be, will appear to be. And what we'll begin to see is the true nature of reality, that is the the information nature of reality that that hey underneath it all there are steps being taken and there's no half steps there's no you know 
1.777 stage. There is no half stage between up and down quark, right? So there's no half stage, which is here. That stage does not exist. You never find a particle or a quark in that existence. It's either up or down. It never goes between in, in the in-between stages. It's never, you know, at, you know, 0.77. It's never at 1.77. It's either at 1 or at 2, up or down, or 0 or 1. It's, it's like binary code. It's as if the universe is running in some sort of binary system like that. Or, or some sort of system with, with functions of either here or there. So when an object moves through space, in this case, this grid of space, the calculations underneath, underneath reality, which don't exist in time and space, since time and space are the result of those calculations themselves, that is, time and space are also part of the illusion we live in. So if we live in a virtual world, time and space aren't real either. No object is real. So time and space are, are just functions of this mathematical equation beneath reality. And since that mathematical equation is outside of time and space, it's beneath the Planck time. So if you were to represent time like this as stages, each one of these is a state of reality, and each one of these dips is a state of non-reality. Right? That's uh, in between. This is the in-between stages. All those, all those infinite steps that don't exist because time doesn't exist there. This is where the equations are being done, so to speak. Right, so those equations are being calculated, and they're saying, right now, this object at, at this time exists at x3, y2. But a second later, it exists as, as um, well, I, was, I wasn't using y, sorry, I was using z and x. It exists as z3 and at x4. So first it was at z3, x2, and then z3, x4. And that's the calculation made. It's a change information. The information changes from here to here. Simple as that. A change of information. That's what we see happening in the quantum world. There's a change of information. Change information, the cork is up, now the cork is down. That's just the way it is. It's, it's, just, it's just the way it is. So at one stage it's up, now it's down. There's no in-between stages. So what's really weird is just like the movie analogy with the film, some things appear to be moving faster than others as far as how long the calculation takes from our point of view. That is, hey, uh, and, 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 and like, let's say, normally what we'd, we'd expect to see, let's say, is it's in the up position, then it's in this position, then it's in this position. Let's say that's what we normally expect to see with like other types of quantum particles. But this one has like a different Inter internal clock as far as how the math works and so it just goes from up to down there is no in-between stage at all uh, but this right here could be a whole stage too I mean it could be theoretically that could be a whole stage but that stage doesn't exist it just this stage or this stage that's only two stages that exist but the in-between stages would not exist either way so those stages any of the stages in between would not exist in this you know if, in this uh, quark analogy I'm using okay so if if this is true, then the other things I mentioned before, the other problems I mentioned, all go away. So Zeno, Zeno's paradox goes away. All of his paradox go away. The Thomson's lamp paradox goes away. Because there comes a point where, when you're flipping that switch back and forth so fast, there comes a point where, on the microscopic world, now you're microscopic, you're switching it so fast, you're getting to like microscopic time, so to speak. You're getting to nano time. You're, you, know, you get down to Planck time. Once you get down so far, time ceases to be. And that's how you're able to make that switch. That's how you're able to pass that turtle. Because you're running so fast. I'm not, not saying you're running fast. You're just, you're, you're traversing so much space that um, what happens is, in the microscopic world, you have traversed from one to the next. You've tra like on, on the microscopic scale, remember, time looks like this time is broken, it's not a continuum. Once you pass that brokenness of time and space, then you have gone from stage one to stage, oops, to stage two, and, okay, once you have traversed that block of space, you went from stage one to stage two, just like that. So you went from here to here once you've traveled, and so it's as if, if you can see on a microscopic world, you would appear to jerk, where all of a sudden there was no movement, and you were just, all, you were just suddenly in the next stage of existence. Um, so, you wouldn't see this in the microscopic world, though. Only on the microscopic world, like each individual of your atoms would just jump, like so to speak. So, in digital physics, then that's how reality uh, works as far as space and time is concerned. Uh, I'll come back with more videos and continue to show how these problems aren't problems if we live in a type of virtual system and what I think the virtual system is and how it works.